bespectacled BAP in the <laughs> department. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Justin Pepperly. Justin received his PhD from McGill University in 2014 uh, before coming to SUNY New Paltz this past fall as visiting assistant professor in the English department. He spent a year as visiting scholar in the Inter Interdisciplinary Center for Culture and Creativity at the University of, Sa of, Sa of Saskatchewan. Um, his research focuses on British mid-century cultural production, uh, particularly cinema, photography, and literary fiction and nonfiction. Justin's talk today is uh, part of a larger book project. That book argues that the wartime collision between surrealism and documentary represents the dominant visual and conceptual rhetoric of representations of war um, on the British home front between 1939 and 1945. The title of his talk is Lucid Abnormality, Lee Miller, Elizabeth Bowen, and the Surrealism of the Second World War. Um, let's welcome Justin Pepper. Um, thank you very much, Sam. I um, have taken the liberty to, uh, to print out copies of one of the stories uh, that I'm going to be referring to today um, called The Inherited Clock, uh, and those are um, to, my, to my left on the table. Um, the title of this talk, Lucid Abnormality, Lee Miller, Elizabeth Bowen, and the Surrealism of the Second World War, takes as its starting point Bowen's diagnosis of the condition of those living in London in 1940 and 41 during the period of nightly aerial bombings known colloquially as the Blitz. Bowen, an Anglo-Irish novelist and short story writer who never belonged to the English Surrealist group, and Miller, a photographer and war correspondent from Poughkeepsie, uh, who was a card-carrying surrealist, noted and recorded the derangement of reality under attack from the sky. In the introduction to her 1945 collection of short fiction, The Demon Lover and Other Stories, Bowen writes, arguably, writers are always slightly abnormal people. Certainly, in so-called normal times, my sense of the abnormal has been very acute. In war, I felt one with and just like everyone else. Sometimes I hardly knew where I stopped and everyone else began. The violent destruction of solid things, the explosion of the illusion that prestige, power, and permanence attached to bulk and weight left us all equally heady and disembodied. Walls went down and we felt, if not knew, each other. We all lived in a state of lucid abnormality. Perhaps nobody documented the violent destruction of solid things uh, during wartime with sharp, sharper precision, Ben Miller. Armed with a Roloflex camera whose waist level viewfinder allowed her to witness uh, with her own naked eye the scenes she photographed, Miller wandered the streets of London on the mornings after air raids and captured the results of Luftwaffe devastation. In Miller's wartime photography, architectural ruin signifies as a metonym not just of the ruination of bodies that rubble conceals, but of a breakdown of social and psychological boundaries that Bowen describes in her wartime fiction. I want to use this talk as an opportunity to put Bowen and Miller in conversation. Uh, I specifically want to think about how their representations of lucid abnormality, in other words, surrealism of everyday life in London during the Blitz, career around ambiguous images of violence. The notion that reality during wartime became surreal <clears throat> is neither new, uh, new nor immune from that critical bugbear, the cliché. To the extent that artists and thinkers like Salvador Dali, Hans Balmer, and Georges Bataille anticipated the figures of disintegration and dismemberment that bombers left behind on the streets of London, the Blitz might be said to represent a kind of surrealist wish fulfillment. This is precisely what the English novelist Evelyn Waugh implies in his satire of the so-called phony war called Put Out More Flags. Waugh remarks the timeliness of aerial warfare for the surrealists, whom he lampoons in the figure of Poppet Green. A remarkably silly girl, Poppet litters her canvases with, quote, bodiless heads, green horses, and violet grass, seaweed, shells and funguses neatly executed, conventionally arranged in the manner of Dali. She anticipates that her, uh, she despairs rather of her derivative art as she should, but Ambrose Silk anticipates that her career will pick up with bombings on the horizon. Quote, you know I should have thought that an air raid was just the thing for a surrealist. 
It ought to give you plenty of compositions, limbs and things lying about in odd places, you know. Silk, of course, turned out to be right, as Waugh, writing from the vantage point of 1942, knew that he would. Limbs and things lying about in odd places, a riff on Max Ernst's definition following Lothermont of surrealism as a, quote, chance meeting on a dissection table between an umbrella and sewing machine, did indeed proliferate during the Blitz, and surrealists were ready with brushes, cameras, and typewriters <coughs> at hand. It was good to be a surrealist in London during the Blitz. If their ideas seemed obvious in a city that appeared literally to be breaking apart, it was because surrealists had merely to look around for their material. The stuff of reality became its own kind of ready-made. Waugh was not the first commentator to turn a derisive eye on a movement that many in Britain perceived as being unserious at best, indecent and even exploitive at worst. Four years before the first wave of bombers transformed the English capital into something that resembled a Dali painting, surrealism invaded London in the form of the International Surrealist Exhibition. Co-organized by the French surrealists uh, André Breton and Paul Eluard, and English surrealists Herbert Reed, uh, Roland Penrose, and, uh, and Humphrey Jennings, the exhibition featured work by artists from 14 different countries, as well as showing collages, paintings, <laughs> sculptures, and various kinds of found objects. It was the site of several noteworthy performances that delighted, but mostly perplexed, the more than 23,000 visitors who attended the exhibition over the course of the month. Louis Bunuel and Dali screened their seminal 1929 film on Chien Andalou, before Dali gave a mostly inaudible lecture on the topic of authentic paranoiac phantoms while wearing a deep sea diving suit, uh, which predictably he had to be uh, helped out of when he lost the ability to breathe. Uh, Dylan Thomas, who was a fledgling surrealist at the time, circulated the gallery and offered uh, guests teacups filled with boiled string, uh, while Sheila Legg, a surrealist artist and occasional model for Dali, gave a much publicized uh, uh, appearance as uh, what she called the surrealist phantom for which she wore a mask uh, covered in roses. Uh, she also carried a prosthetic limb and a pork chop for a period of time. The pork chop inevitably started to stink, and so uh, she had to abandon that. Uh, not all of the 27 British artists whose work uh, was featured at the exhibition wound up aligning with the Surrealist group. People like Cecil Collins, Graham Sutherland, and Robert Medley, for example, had no formal ties to Surrealism either before or after the summer of 1936. Uh, but the event did, however, motivate a group of artists to unite under a more or less common set of values and goals. The International Surrealist Exhibition thus might be said to have prepared a generation of cultural producers in Britain to see and represent the war on the home front, specifically in terms of surrealism. To say that reactions to the Surrealist exhib Exhibition tended to be negative would be to put the case rather too mildly. Uh, artists and their artworks were attacked in the British press and in the private correspondence of at least one of the key figures for my talk. A review of surrealism and art for the Daily Telegraph characterized the movement as one of, quote, poor jokes, pointless indelicacies, and relics of an outworn romanticism. A writer for the Manchester Evening News described surrealism as, quote, meaninglessness for the sake of meaninglessness, a travesty of everything that's decent. In an evening news article called Surrealist Art is Clumsy as Well as Meaningless, the writer admits of Merritt Oppenheim's Breakfast and Fur, quote, frankly, I don't see why a sense of world despair should make you want to construct a cup, saucer, and spoon out of rabbit fur. It is not worth looking at. I don't mind its being meaningless, but it is horribly clumsy as well. <laughs> what exactly were people looking at when they looked at surrealist art? Elizabeth Bowen, for one, wasn't sure. In a letter to William Plomer, her editor at Jonathan Cape, dated 17 August 1936, she wrote, quote, since seeing you, I have been at Hythe, but mostly in London, which has been very hot. I think of settling at Hythe. I missed you at that surrealist opening. What chaos. <laughs> Autumn seems a funny time to be bombed, Bowen writes in her essay, London 1940s. And we want to ask, funny how? Funny ha-ha or funny strange? Surrealist strange? 
limbs and things lying about in odd places, strange. Despite her immediate aversion to surrealism, whether to the chaos of the exhibition or the movement itself, she reacts to the experience and aftermath of the first day of the Blitz with a surrealist eye for the collision between the laughable and the traumatic. Graham Greene, Bowen's contemporary, notes a similar emergence of black comedy in uh, his 1943 novel, The Ministry of Fear. Quote, blast is an odd thing. It is just as likely to have the effect of an embarrassing dream as of man's serious vengeance on man landing you naked in the street, or exposing you on your bed, or on your laboratory seat, to your neighbor's gaze. For artists, writers, and ordinary citizens alike, exposure represents a dominant experience of everyday life on the British home front. As bombs rendered increasingly tenuous the divide between interior and exterior, public and private, concealment and revelation. Nor could one always be certain of the gap between the trivial and the catastrophic. Bowen notes that after having been, quote, exiled from her flat in Regent's Park on account of time bombs, she says, she found herself worrying not over questions of safety, but, quote, about my typewriter left uncovered in the dust blowing through our suddenly emptied house. The characteristic ambiguity of Bowen's writing, Bowen's syntax, leaves us unclear as to whether she's worried about glass blowing into the home or the typewriter blowing out of it. Both interpretations and both occurrences strike me as equally plausible. Explosion tends not to be unidirectional. Bombs that rip through buildings could project objects, and for that matter, people, out of them. Perhaps we feel in Bowen's premonition of her beloved typewriter blowing through her home reverberate in the snarled cogs and gears of the blown up machine that Lee Miller represents in her photograph, Remington Silent as well as being a metaphor of the threat that Nazis imposed to the foundational tenet in democracy, the ability of an informed citizenry to communicate, including through writing. Miller's image of an obliterated Remington typewriter testifies to how bombs transformed London into a showcase for the kinds of assisted ready-mades that Marcel Duchamp installed and photographed in Alfred Stieglitz's 291 Art Gallery in New York City more than 20 years earlier. Miller, an American from Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, cultivated her interest in assisted ready-mades in the years during which she lived and studied uh, in Paris with Man Ray. Whereas Man updated Duchamp's ready-made praxis by damaging the everyday household items that he exhibited and photographed, as he does here in Cadeau, uh, whose 14 bronze spikes render a continental flat iron useless, Miller trains her camera on an object that's been removed from its original setting, a room in Bowen's Regent's Park flat, for example, or one just like it, and damaged not by a surrealist artist, but by a bomb. To the extent that Hitler's Luftwaffe disinstalled objects from homes and launched them outside, exposing them to the view of anyone who might happen upon them, it might be said to have worked unwittingly on behalf of surrealism. Like Cadeau, Miller's typewriter compensates for its negligible functionality by presenting its discoverer with a visually arresting form. Silenced, it's no longer really a typewriter at all, but a contorted mess of plastic and steel that makes itself available to unintended usage. Miller reverses the double act of recontextualization and exposure that converted the machine from typewriter to objet trouvé by taking its photograph, that is, exposing photosensitive paper to light, then placing the mechanically reproduced image in a collection of photographs called Grim Glory, Pictures of Britain Under Fire. First published in the United States as part of a Ministry of Information campaign to encourage Americans to support the Allied war effort, Ernestine Carter's Compendium of Images of the Blitz features 22 photographs by Miller in and among photographs and film stills called from the Gaumont British Newsreel Company and the General Post Office or GDO Film Unit. The intent of the volume was to provide American audiences with access into the everyday realities of life on the British home front. In his preface, the American radio broadcaster Edward R. Murrow contends that the book is bound to generate empathy for the people of Britain by, quote, offering you a glimpse of their battle, end of quote. If the assumption that to look is to enter into an ethical relationship with the person or people being represented in the photograph strikes some of us as dubious, 
we're in good company. Miller's photographs of the Blitz depict smashed objects and architectural ruin, never human or for that matter animal victims of Nazi explosives. Nor does she offer the viewer much in the way of access. She tends to frame objects like the blown up typewriter in Remington's silence from close up, such that we've got very little sense of the surrounding terrain. The utility of the photograph is almost as uncertain as that of the object it represents. What propaganda value could an image of an isolated, obliterated typewriter uh, really have? Where the framing, composition, and subject matter of Miller's photographs deny the viewer access into the ordeal of Londoners under nightly attack, they invite her to consider the implications of looking at photographs in general and photographic representations of violence in particular. A species of modernist image making which often calls attention to the flatness of the representational plane in order to reveal its medium specific qualities. Surrealist photography seldom fails to find some way to communicate its photographic status. In her seminal essay, The Photographic Conditions of Surrealism, Rosalind Krauss describes photography as being central definitive to the surrealist movement because of what she calls its, quote, privileged connection to the real. Surrealists dating from Breton were preoccupied with photography, she argues, because they viewed them as indexes of actuality, representations and pieces of reality simultaneously. Krauss writes, quote, Surrealist photography exploits the special connection to reality with which all photography is endowed. For photography is an imprint or transfer off the real. It is a photochemically processed uh, trace causally connected to the thing in the world to which it refers in a matter parallel to that of fingerprints or footprints or the rings of water that cold glasses leave on tables. The photograph is thus genetic, generically distinct from painting or sculpture or drawing. On the family tree of images, it is closer to palm trees, death masks, the Shroud of Turin, or the tracks of gulls on beaches. For technically and semiologically speaking, drawings and paintings are icons, while photographs are indexes. Krauss extends her semiological assessment of surrealist photography in her discussion of convulsive beauty a term Breton introduces at the end of his 1928 novel, Nadja, when he introduces, quote, beauty will be convulsive or it will not be at all, end of quote. Whereas critics like Charlotte Hutchison understand this term as an expression of surrealism's dedication to exhibiting disturbing uh, psychological upheavals at the level of the individual mind or social body, Krauss identifies convulsive beauty as that quality in a surrealist artwork that invites the viewer or reader into an experience of reality as representation. A reminder, quote, that we are not looking at reality, but at a world infested by interpretation or signification. What makes the beauty of surrealist photographs convulsive is the degree to which it reveals ruptures in the fabric of a seemingly coherent reality. Surrealist photographers like Miller insist on the indexicality of photographic images in ways that both rely upon and interrupt claims to realism upon which the medium of photography is based. Photographs like Remington Silent activate psychological and semiological definitions of convulsive beauty insofar as they invite being viewed as metaphors of the turbulent mental condition of Londoners during the Blitz and emphasize their indexical relationship to the found objects that they literally represent. If all analog photographs bear traces of their causal connection to the world in a manner that makes them similar to fingerprints, an understanding of the medium of photography that Krauss shares with Andre Bazin in his essay, The Ontology of the Photographic Image, then photographs of touched objects manifest what I'll clumsily call a double ontology. Catherine Conley describes touch as the key to data and surrealist fascinations with found objects. Invisible or barely perceptible fingerprints on things like buttons, coins, and toys invest those objects with something like a Benjaminian aura, an uncanny sense of having been thereness. Instead of destroying the aura, uh, as Benjamin claims happens to the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, photographs of touched things reduplicate the aura. They restore to photography a technology of distance, rigidity, and objectivity, 
a sense of tactility and even perhaps subjectivity. Miller's photograph piano by Broadwood might be said to reduplicate Remington's silent by depicting an instrument that resembles the blown up typewriter and functions in similar ways. Both objects have keyboards that users strike with their fingertips to produce music and text respectively. <coughs> Indeed, the, count the piano is a kind of enlarged version of the typewriter. A flat panel rests in front of ball board and case, where strings in the former and type bars in the latter get set into motion by the movement of hands. Whereas the typewriter has been so mangled that it hardly looks like a typewriter at all, the piano appears to be in relatively good shape, uh, despite being covered with concrete and steel. The keys of the piano, like those of the typewriter, are snarled and chipped, but perhaps not to the extent of irreparability. Tilted on the diagonal, the instrument might still be capable of being played, depending upon the severity of the internal damage that the body conceals from view. Like all musical instruments, the piano asks to be touched, even as, photographs, uh, even as the photograph rather emphasizes silence and stasis, the object hints at a former and perhaps future life in which the fingering of keys will produce a very different sound from the whistle of an incoming bomb. While Miller's photographs of found objects double or at least call attention to the aura that accompanies understanding touch as a residue of past experience, they explicitly reject the monumentalism that Benjamin uh, attributes to cultural production under fascism. Instead of greeting either handler or viewer with something immutable, eternal, and intended to be regarded at a respectful distance, Miller's found objects invite the very tactile interactions that monuments deny. As icons of cultural achievement, monuments reject any notion of history as live object. They represent the past in tributary form while casting the present in the shadow of an idealized bygone age. Miller's sense of the fraught cultural politics of monuments was nothing if not well earned. She played a reanimated Venus statue in Jean Cocteau's 1930 film Le Saint d'un Poète. So when the student of avant-garde European cinema encounters revenge on culture in the pages of her Grim Glory, she can't help but view the, uh, the photograph of a toppled Venus as a double or reduplication of the role that the photographer played uh, embodied, literally embodied, a decade earlier. Here, Miller obviates the reverential distance from which monuments ask to be viewed by framing the fallen statue close up. The vantage point reveals the various ways in which the Venus has been sullied, even violated, in its projection into a pile of rubble. Dirt coats the fingers from the knuckles up and lines the top of the forearm. A pyramid of dirt fans uh, from a point between the breasts before opening up to cover the entire chest. The black cord that follows the right arm across the neck formally decapitates the statue and divides the photograph into unequal halves. A brick rests diagonally over the left breast, providing the body with a limited coverage that the fully visible right breast renders meaningless, even somewhat pathetic. The duplicated or reduplicated or re-reduplicated Venus statue makes yet another appearance in Miller's work in her best known photograph of the Second World War, Lee Miller in Hitler's bathtub. The photograph makes good on the promise of its title by representing uh, Miller transported from behind to in front of the camera where she appears naked in the same place that Hitler washed his naked body. Miller had gained access to Hitler's Munich apartment on 30 April 1945 coincidentally the same day that Hitler shot himself in his underground bunker in Munich, uh, after having tethered herself to the 179th Regiment of the United States Armed Forces as an official war correspondent. In fact, Miller heard news of Hitler's uh, suicide via his radio while she lay on his and Eva Baron's bed. In the bathtub, Miller takes to a dark comic extreme the ideas of access and exposure that she troubles over in much of her war photography. The photograph contains multiple doublings that align her work during the Blitz uh, in Grim Glory with the work she performed on behalf of Vogue magazine, where she published articles and photographs uh, documenting her experience as one of the very first people to en enter uh, the Nazi death camps after the fall of the Third Reich. 
The image of Miller's naked body recalls the numerous photographs for which she posed uh, naked as early as 1915, when her father, an amateur photographer, uh, took, new, took photographs of her in snapshots and stereoscopic images. The photograph also includes a photographic double of Hitler in the form of a portrait that appears on the back left ledge of the tub. Miller positions herself between, portrait and, between the portrait and a miniature Venus statue on the right, a double of the figure that she played in Cocteau's film, which she then redoubles in the photograph of a smashed statue in uh, Revenge on Culture. Behind her, uh, in the, behind the combat boots, um, Grime, from her recent tour of uh, a death camp in Dachau, registers traces of the decomposing bodies that she witnessed and photographed for her Vogue story, Believe It. Um, believe it or not, um, Miller was publishing, um, well, war correspondence and filing photographs with, with Vogue magazine. Uh, Vogue wanted her to be writing, um, you know, stories about fashion and, and she wasn't having it. And they published them. Um, the portrait, statue, and dirt have similar qualities to the photograph itself. They are all objects of psychic referral and unsettle the viewer by virtue of their real, tangible connection to violent history. Fingerprints abound. When Miller posed for the shot, she entangles herself inside a cat's cradle of representation. Captured photographically, she situates herself inside a chain of signification that repeats, however distorted, like reflections in a hall of mirrors. Miller's record of exposing herself to the patina of history that resides on the objects, furniture, and fixtures that had earlier been touched by Hitler, whom she viewed as a, quote, machine monster, and Barone, whom she thought of as a person uncomfortably not unlike herself, um, finds a corollary in Elizabeth Bowen's reflections on the weirdness of coming into contact with touched things. For Bowen, as for Miller, poems are not just what the architect and theorist of architecture Le Corbusier called, quote, machines for living in. Inhabited by objects, they are always necessarily repositories of the past. When Miller entered Hitler's and Brown's home, she did not merely look, she also took care to touch. As well as noting, quote, it was macabre to doze on the pillow of a girl and man who were now dead, and to be glad they were dead, she describes rifling through Brown's medicine cabinet and using her cosmetics. Quote, Elizabeth Arden lipstick, a half bottle of Arden skin tonic, little funnels and spatulas for transforming beauty products. Whereas Miller gleefully, morbidly goes out of her way to touch the touched things of the home's prior inhabitants, Bowen finds that she cannot avoid the psychic residue that adheres to objects, try as she might. In her essay, Opening Up the House, published in the August 1945 issue of Vogue, two months <coughs> after the magazine ran Miller's story about her time in Munich, <laughs> Bowen articulates a sense of the uncanniness of entering one's home at the end of the war and encountering traces of former lives, whether one's own or those of others, strangers. Those unnumbered human beings who came and wet, went, kept it in motion by the clockwork of wartime, using the furniture, opening and shutting doors, neglecting or at random cultivating the gardens to which their tenancy gave them a passing right, have left something behind them, something that will not evaporate so quickly as the smell of unfamiliar cigarettes. These now departed dwellers in one's house cannot fail to be seen as either enigmas or enemies. One must try to dwell on them as enigmas. Rings left by glasses or burns left by cigarettes may mark those parts of the rooms in which they preferred to encamp. Dinges on the springs of armchairs and sofas record their characteristic ways of sitting, and books displaced or upside down in the shelves indicate what they read, if they read. They preferred, apparently, to sleep in the dining room dine in the sleeping porch. Blotters remain crisscrossed with their different writings. It is to be guessed from the ink on the mantelpiece that someone wrote his letters standing up, and ghostly indentations of someone's doodling are found on the left behind telephone pad. Homes occupied by others reverberate, not just with the aftershocks of detonations, but with the patterns of day-to-day -day behavior that took shape while one was away. Styles of life to which one, wa one was not privy, 
but which assuredly were not one's own. Whether happy or troubling, the opening up of the house, quote, must be disturbing, Bowen writes, because it accompanies a sense of breach. One never comes back to the same place that one left behind, least of all during or after a war. To encounter material signifiers of the existence of other people, grooves in seat cushions or markings left behind by unfamiliar hands, is to come into contact with ghosts. They were here. They are still here. Characters who inhabit Bowen's wartime collection of short fiction, The Demon Lover and Other Stories, encounter ghosts whenever they happen upon touched objects. Those who live among other people's things, as Miller did during her occupation of Hitler's and Ava Brown's home, remark the strange, sentient quality of objects, their paradoxical status as animate and inanimate, living and dead. In his essay on some motifs in Baudelaire, Benjamin argues that the experience of the aura of a work of art, quote, rests on the transposition of a response common in human relationships to the relationship between the inanimate or natural object and man. To perceive the aura of an object, he claims, we must, we look at means to invest it with the ability to look at us in return. The unidentified speaker in Bowen's story, Pink May, activates a Benjaminian understanding, or maybe more accurately, misunderstanding of the erratic potential of objects when she says to her implied interlocutor, quote, you know how it is about other people's belongings. You can't ever quite use them, and they seem to watch you the whole time. Her unsettling feeling of being looked at by the objects that occupy the furnished home that she and her husband Neville rent, presumably after having been bombed out of uh, their own home, leads her to the conclusion that the house is haunted. Quote, yes, it was funny, she said about the ghost. It used to come into my bedroom when I was dressing for dinner, when I was dressing to go out. Her paranoid sense of ghostliness probably derives from guilt. Involved in an affair, she believes the poltergeist must be, quote, a Puritan with some chip on her shoulder, who avenges her sense of offended morality by doing little things to my belongings. <coughs> the multiple uh, valences of possession in the story originate in characters over identification with objects. By investing things with psychic power, the speaker makes herself available to the experience of being haunted. The ghost, a projection of the woman's crumbling psyche, has a ruinous effect upon her married life. While she and her husband survived the experience of air raids, their marriage, quote, crashed into bits when she revealed to him, hell, I've got a ghost in my room. There are, of course, objects invested with at least a technological capacity for looking at us, whether in return or without our knowledge, cameras. Though Bowen insists in the preface to The Demon Lover that she, quote, cannot photograph like those who photographed the tottering, lace-like architecture of ruins during the Blitz, she attributes to her story photographic qualities, not perhaps the objectivity of photographs, but something of their receptivity. Writers uh, of the 1930s routinely describe themselves as cameras. At the beginning of his partly fictional, partly documentary novel, Goodbye to Berlin, Christopher Isherwood announces, quote, I am a camera with its shutter open, quite passive, recording, not thinking. Someday all this will have to be developed, carefully printed, fixed. Isherwood's claim, and the many claims just like it, extends Breton's description of psychic automatism in his first manifesto of surrealism, when he writes that surrealist artists should aspire to the biologically indeterminate status of, quote, modern, modest recording instruments. Bowen echoes Breton, and to some extent Isherwood, when she claims that her stories represent, quote, received impressions of happening things. Disjected snapshots, snapshots taken from close up to close up in the middle of the melee of a battle. Where she rejected the chaos of surrealism in the aftermath of the 1936 International Surrealist Exhibition, Bowen employs its conceptual vocabulary to make sense of the ways in which the, quote, overcharged subconsciousness of everybody overflowed and merged during the war. The migration of psychic experience from one subconscious mind to another finds a home in Bowen's description of intersemiotic translation, the movement across and between representational media from language to photography, photography back to language. 
the heightened sensitivity of human consciousness to collective psychic experience discovers a material correlative in glass, not just in Bowen's wartime writings, but in the work of surrealist artists like Claude Cahoon, Man Ray, and Lee Miller. Surrealists were fascinated with glass objects, including camera lenses, both because of their breakability and their unique receptivity to light, matter, and vibration. Glass registers the detonation of bombs by shattering. Uh, the landscape of the Blitz was replete with shards of glass, as Bowen notes in her essay, London 1940, when she reports that, quote, the whole length of Oxford Street, west to east, is empty, looks polished like a ballroom, glitters with smashed glass. And in her 1949 novel about the Second World War, The Heat of the Day, when her narrative remarks, quote, the tinkle of broken glass being swept up by the crisp, uh, among the crystal leaves. In her discussion of bell jars in surrealist photographs, Catherine Conley aligns the glass domes in which apparently decapitated heads are encased with the cameras that isolate and record their images. Bell jar photographs are, quote, self-referentially about photography, she contends. The glass of the bell jar separating the head from the viewer symbolizes and concretizes the glass lens through which the photographer sees the head. The viewer is thus put in the place of photographer and becomes conscious of seeing a head through glass. Designed to protect organic material like plants uh, from degradation, bell jars share with photographs the capacity to preserve. Yet images of bell jars also thematize photography's <coughs> excuse me, inherent allusion to mortality by representing their models in states of existential ambiguity. Are they alive, dead, or somewhere in between? The heads in bell jar photographs float in states of suspension. They appear to have ghostly access to the world of the living and the dead. By covering them with bell jars, then photographing them, surrealist artists invest their models with a dual liminality. At the same time as they're preserved, they're also immobilized, rigidified by glass dome and camera alike. In Bowen's story, The Inherited Clock, Clara becomes ghostly when her cousin Paul encases her head inside the bell jar that normally surrounds the titular object. Having repressed a traumatic memory from her childhood, she discovers the source of her spectral associations with the skeleton clock as an adult in the climactic event of the tale. Uh, when she says to Paul, quote, every time I am told I remember something I don't remember, it turns out to be something about that clock. Did you, for instance, once put the clock glass over my head, and did I get stuck inside it? When they were children, Paul convinced Clara to jam her finger into the gears of the mechanism. Her illicit touch stopped it from ticking, thus rendering the dominant belief about the clock that it had, quote, not stopped ticking for more than 100 years untrue. Paul explains that he turned Clara into a kind of bell jar model to punish her for her attempted blackmail. Knowing full well that owning up to her act would fetch trouble for them both, Clara threatened to divulge their mutual secret, unless Paul agreed to give her a kiss. Quote, it was, oh Paul, I feel so wicked. We've been so wicked. I have simply got to confess to cousin Rosanna. Then, very well, kiss me. Then perhaps I'll feel better. Then perhaps I won't have to tell cousin Rosanna this time. The glass of the bell jar functioned as a physical barrier between Clara's and Paul's mouths. It's what prohibited her threatened act of coercion. Tellingly, violence characterized his preemptive deed. He tells her that when he finally removed the glass dome from her head, he, quote, damn nearly chipped your face off. Just as Clara inscribed herself upon the clock, so the clock inscribed itself upon her. Lodged into the works, her finger was, quote, wedged in them, bruised in them, bitten into and eaten up by the cogs. Her aunt Anne tells her that the poor little forefinger of your right hand was really a rather shocking sight, black and blue with several small ugly cuts. As well as marking her physically, the clock made psychological imprints, such that when she finally inherits the object, she could, quote, anticipate feeling her sanity being demolished. She reflects, the skeleton clock in daylight was threatening to a degree its oddness could not explain. Looking through the glass at its wheels, cogs, springs, and tensions, and at its upraised striker, 
Awaiting with a sensible quiver the finish of the hour that was in force, Clara tried to tell herself that it was only shocking to see the anatomy of time. The clock was without a face, its 12 numerals being welded onto a just visible wire ring. As she watched, the minute hand against its background of nothing made one, then another spectral advance. The clock's uncanny ability to demolish her psychological well-being prompts Claire to align the object with the bombs that obliterate the city every night. After Paul correctly guesses that she must have considered launching the clock out of her window, whereupon, quote, some early goer to work would halt, step back, and bend his torch on the cogs, uncoiled springs, and incomprehensible splinters of this singular object today, she admits to herself that she was not the sort of woman who could do that sort of thing, particularly given, quote, the immediate alarm to be raised by what would sound like a bomb. Clara's former occupancy inside the bell jar identifies her with the clock, the ticking of which reminds her that she is, as we all are, running out of time. The clock's identification as a potential explosive suggests, by implication, that Clara's cracked psyche is both subject and object, cause and effect of the turmoil that she manufactures and endures. Bowen's skeleton clock, like Lee Miller's bell jar, denotes the mechanical cessation of time by making literal what Conley calls the indexical and therefore ghostly aspects of touch that define the medium of photography in general and surrealism's understanding of photographs in particular. Whether via the pressing of a finger into the gears of a clock or onto the shutter release button of a camera, time stands still as a technological effect as well perhaps as an emblem of the rupture in the flow of continuous biological time. During air raids, bombs actualize something that photographs do at the level of metaphor, stop lives. When an explosion detonates over there, rather than here, we can be sure that people, many people, had their lives halted at a set moment in their duration, extricated from their destiny, which is what Bazin claims happens to anyone who's had his or her image taken. Against Bazin's figurative language, Miller and Bowen understand that they traffic in actual experiences of human suffering, and that the gap between reality and representation is, therefore, a difference that makes a difference. If Miller's and Bowen's wartime work represents the ways in which reality has caught up with the surrealist imagination, so might it also show the limitations of surrealism, that there's nothing so very beautiful after all in its evocations of convulsive beauty. Thank you. Uh, you can imagine that this material uh, is familiar in a way that has now crossed the threshold and become over familiar. So I would be delighted for questions um, that um, put this work into a kind of different um, perspective from the one that I'm uh, currently armed with. So I, I, I welcome questions. Tom, um, there have still been two very quick, or one, one is very quick, it's a yes, no, and the other is not so quick. Is I don't know an option? Or? Uh, no, I think you do know. It has to do with that, that iconic um, first slide of the bombed out library. Yeah. Is, is that actually um, one of Lee Miller's? It is not. No, um, that is uh, in a collection uh, by uh, J.D. Priestley, who was... Um, uh, he was really the voice of Britain during, uh, uh, the radio voice of Britain during the war. Um, I think the collection is called Britain at War. It was one of um, multiple collections of photographs that circulated um, in the United States. So, so like Grim Glory, uh, Priestley's collection was, was intended for publication here to um, you know, convince your parents and grandparents to support the war effort. Um, uh, unfortunately, or tellingly, or whatever, um, this photograph is, is staged, uh, so you know um, it would be really great if these three guys were like so committed to uh, going to the library that, that uh, <laughs> the narrator couldn't slow them down. But uh, they were indeed, uh, you know, what kind of clear evocation of keeping calm and carrying on than uh, mm -hmm. these fellows who are like not gonna not gonna let uh, an area slow them down. Uh, so yeah, so that so that takes care of that. And what was the second? Just a really quick follow-on. So was. Do you have a sense that it was staged to kind of represent a British stiff upper lip to American? Views? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so 
so much of the propaganda, and there's there's an entire sort of um, an entire kind of field of cultural production, um, one of which um, is is Humphrey Jennings' uh, *London Can Take It*, which my class viewed today. Um, so so many films, so much photography, gets gets published and um, sent to the United States um, as a way to um, model a particular kind of national quality, right? So. Um, so against the kinds of prejudices that an American audience might have to, you know, to uh, to, to British people, um, you know, ideas of communality, of collectivism, um, even something like kind of burgeoning um, socialism, um, these were sort of tailor-made for uh, for American audiences. I also, you know, am inclined to think that there was a real element of, you know, truth that as you know, this kind of represents what. Colbert would call truthiness, but uh, but but there was I think you know London can take it represents like real footage. So um, I do sort of tend to think that Londoners, um, you know, they were scared out of their wits, but it, it's cool that they went to work too. Um, so so I, I tend to think that even though those images of, of national identity were carefully crafted, um, they came from a place that was real. Um, Recognized. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Let me pass on the second question then if there's time. Oh, great. This, um, this is a statement. <coughs> okay. I really enjoyed your paper. Oh, thank you. That's a person. <laughs> and today, um, 2016, 2016, feels much like the 1930s in my head. Yes, I know. It's, <laughs> it's a very, yes. Um, I was just, uh, before I came to your lecture, I went to the Flint Water Lecture. Are you familiar with what's happening in Flint? Okay. <clears throat> so that that lecture was very gripping and very upsetting because we see what's happening in this in today's times. Mm -hmm. In today's times. So I, th this kind of your paper was marvelous. I really loved it. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I see a similarity and a metaphor and. Really and I love the work. You know, what, on the topic of the sort of the currency um, uh, of, of anything that I'm kind of working over here, one of the things that that, um, that I've been thinking about, particularly, and so I've got this whole long thing about, about Miller in Hitler's Munich apartment uh, that, that I don't kind of get at here, um, but it does speak to this sort of compulsion that occupying, um, occupying forces have to enter the home and you know and use it and defile it. So if you remember, um, you know during the the second Iraq uh, Gulf War, um, so many images circulate of American armed forces entering into Saddam Hussein's bunker, you know, or, or mansion in Baghdad, and you know playing the pool table and, and like sitting on his toilet and just defiling the place, right? Um, and I wonder if I wonder where that comes from. I mean, I, I tend to think there's a sort of long historical trajectory of that mm -hmm. um, that Miller is sort of picking up on. And you know, so every time sort of a, a, a group, uh, you know, an occupying force enters a place, there seems to be this compulsion to like make its domestic space its own. Um, and we see that kind of uh, all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And the word Renaissance. You know, we're constantly having Renaissances, so to speak. Rebirth and re revisioning of something, and your surrealism certainly um, <coughs> connected with how I see the world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Beth. Well, yeah, I got a lot of things. That I okay. Say. We're, we're going to have. I wondered, if, we're I wondered have if you might. Multiple uh, copies. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, I mean, I've got you know, a couple little bones that I would pick. I'd okay. Want to do it publicly, like that, that picture of her in Hitler's bathtub. That was not a Lee Miller's photograph. No, that was, was David Sherman. It was David Sherman. Yes, I should give him credit. And for that. I, mean, yeah. I actually interviewed Dave before he died a couple of okay. times and talked to him about this photograph. Okay. And he's, oh, that's Lee being an old model there. You yeah. Know? And if you look at his production of photographs from, he was a Life magazine photographer yeah. and also her lover during the war. And they traveled <laughs> to these places together. They, they, they were there in Munich together, yeah. obviously. Um, and he's, he taught her about setting up photographs. That's one of the things that he showed her about how to do. He was the master of the Life kind of punchline set up photograph. Yep. So he published a number of those in Life. If you look at his production of published photographs, 
the bathtub photograph fits right mm -hmm. in with all of those in terms of how it's organized and just like setting up the, the joke sort of yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and one of my, my bones to pick with like the, the, a lot of the literature on that image is that people keep crediting it to Lee. Yeah. And it's not her agency. And it, I mean, it's really right. not her photograph, as far as I'm, right. from what I have been able to. Right, yeah. yeah, I think that's a good, you know, that's a good point. And I, that was a slippage that I, I take responsibility for and I should have attributed it to, to Sherman. Um, at the same time, I, I do, you know, sense a kind of authorial, um, authorial presence in the sense that I mean, there is this kind of self-fashioning, this way that she, that Miller is thinking about, um, you know, problems of photographic exposure that Grim Glory is really interested in, right? So, so many of the photographs in Grim Glory aren't about access, but a lack of access. So you're getting, you know, close-up photographs of, of rubble pouring out of buildings where you don't have any contact. You just got through a pile of, of ruin. Um, so, so it's curious to me that sort of, you know, and this is all in the aftermath of, of, of having, you know, photographed in Dachau and published yeah. photographs of, of death camps, um, where she is, she is literally performing an act of, of self-exposure. So there's a, there's a clear kind of performative quality to this photograph. Um, what I'm sort of interested in, and, and yes, you're, you're totally right that, that, you know, the photographer, the credit to the photograph belongs to Sherman. Um, I am still interested in the ways that she is deliberately kind of situating herself in this nexus of, of signification right. that has a long history with her own career, with photographs that she's taken, with you know in, um, roles that she's she's been and, and also the, the inserting herself into the domestic sphere. Yeah, there's a lot of tremendously interesting stuff that goes on from the time she's a she was one of the first photographers at Buchenwald also, yeah. and her photographs at Buchenwald are different from everybody else's photographs. Yeah. But she doesn't focus primarily on the you know body stacked up like cordwood or the victims or the whatever. Yeah. Uh, she though th that's the, some of her most chilling photographs. She photographed the captured SS guards yeah. who were being held by the, the Allies, and she does these like intense yeah. kind of like close up frontal images of these guys yeah. who have been beaten up by the inmates because yeah. that was like SOP when they took over the camps. They would. The, the troops would hang back for an hour or two and let the inmates like revenge themselves on people. Yeah. So these guys have cauliflower ears and busted noses yeah. and whatever and all this kind yeah. of stuff. And she photographs these guys, kind of like really into, like she's a, she she was mad as hell when oh, she yeah. went to camp. And it was about these were the guys who were like doing this stuff and she was like trying to yeah. hold people responsible. But at the same time, there's this weird identification process that goes in. Um, minor point with your paper, there were two different locations. There was Hitler's apartment in Munich on Prince Wegattensklasse, and then up the road was Ava Brown's house. She yeah. had a separate house, mm -hmm. and they went to the house the next day. Yeah. Um, can people tell that I've been researching this? Too? <laughs> <laughs> and it was when they got to Ava Brown's house, that's where she has the Elizabeth Arden lipsticks and, the, yeah. and, and, and inserting that whole thing. From Dave, I got this fascinating piece. Of, well, I mean, it's all about. You know, she's writing for a women's magazine. She's writing about this woman's toiletries and personal items, yeah. and, and really inserting herself in, the, in that sphere. Yeah. The the really the thing she doesn't mention, and, and it's an amazing piece of writing. I mean, you should, her writing yeah. just blows my mind. Uh, it's an amazing piece of writing about when she gets and, and, and the idea of like taking a nap in the bed, you know, in Abram Brown's bed. Mm -hmm. Dave tells me, of course, they had sex in that bed. <laughs> so she's having sex with this Jewish photographer in Ava Brown's house. And then she takes the nap. But it's, you know, and, and then she's talking about Hitler and Ava Brown having been in the bed. Yeah. There's this, like, yeah, occupation least, of the same space of, right. like, being in right. this weird, right. strange position. Yeah, yeah, a couple of things that I'll say about that. One of, one of them, and, and you remember this, is, is you know, this sort of uh, meditation on, on how... Um, they never, like, Barone and, and Hitler never kind of came fully alive to her in her imagination until they were dead, and until she could sort of do this act of a kind of psychic reconstruction mm -hmm. of, of sort of going through the paces of, of their domestic life. Um, I, I want to show you, so I've got a whole thing on, on some of her photographs of, of Nazi guards, but um, uh, if you remember the one in... Um, uh, where she's she's framing it from from a high angle, standing on the, uh, the edge of a shore, and there's a Nazi guard inside profile, and you can see sort of shimmering light off his cheek. Um, oh, the, 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 the canal picture. I, from yeah, the canal. yeah, I think it's called Dead SS Guard. Yeah, it's, it's, and I have a whole story backstory for that. Okay, well, yes, yeah, we will we will talk. Yeah, okay. we will talk. So I would love to do something <laughs> written on that. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Yeah, yeah.
Uh, yeah, Vicki. Um, so thank you for that talk. That was fantastic, um, Justin. And my, I'm just, you know, uh, it was bursting with suggestions. And I want to um, ask you about Bowen. Um, uh, I love Bowen's work, and I haven't read The Inherited Clock, but now will. Um, one of the things that's so challenging about her work is the way in which she's kind of um, playing with the conventions of realism. She's yeah. modernist. Um, there's something opaque about the textures of her writing, mm -hmm. that um, the pacing is odd. It's impossible to kind of penetrate tone in yeah. her writing. There's no liquidity to it. Yeah. Um, and most of the writing of, of Bowen's that I've read is, is from earlier, prior to the Second World War, so her writing of the 20s and 30s. Um, but um, so I always think of it as a kind of like botched realism in a way. But I've never connected it with surrealism and um, and, and the photography that, that's surrounding her. Um, so let's see. I'm trying to form this into a question. Um, so um, so part of those um, those textures, the ways in which her her prose kind of alerts us to the surfaces of her language. Um, you're suggesting kind of comes from the photography of the surrealist moment, is that? Well, I think, um, and I will solicit uh, Stella to, to jump in here at any time with our other kids working. Uh, well, I don't know. showed up, so no, I will. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know her work of the 30s very well, so, so, um, so those of you who know her stuff in the 30s uh, better um, can, can um, intervene on what I'm saying as you, as you choose. Um, I tend to think that, um, I mean, I told my class today that I, I'm, I'm not sure about Bowen's status as a modernist, but what I am sure of uh, is that she represents uh, the first generation of people who read modernism in their formative years. Um, and so the work of Joyce, um, the work of Virginia Woolf, um, it wasn't sort of unnatural to her in a way that it was unnatural to Galsworthy or right. Arnold Bennett or H.G. Right. Wells. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that there's a sort of, I mean, I don't know if I situate Bowen as a modernist. Uh, okay. I certainly don't yeah. situate her as a surrealist. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that there's something about surrealism that, um, that becomes just sort of part of the cultural lexicon. So mm -hmm. even as people aren't fully identifying with the surrealist mm -hmm. movement, I think that there is a kind of visual and conceptual language that starts to circulate and give people um, mm -hmm. a means of making sense of this thing that that surrealists had anticipated in certain ways, but which um, was sort of beyond the imagination of mm -hmm. the ordinary citizen. Mm -hmm. um, so the things that I think are really fascinating about her writing um, in in the in the short stories and, and then certainly in the novel is are the things that you're describing, right? Like the kind of um, contortions of language, mm -hmm. the fragmentariness of it, the um, the opacity of the language, right? Mm -hmm. So so she uses really interested, interesting words. So for example disjected snapshots. These stories are disjected snapshots. What the hell does the word disjected mean? I have no idea. Right. Um, I mean, I have an idea, but I've been wrestling with it for like yeah. four years. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah. she uses language in a sort of way that doesn't immediately lend itself to correct like, meaning. Right. Um, and so I don't know if, if you know, because I haven't spent time with novels like The Death of the Heart or, mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, the novels of the 30s, but I don't know. I mean, Stella, do you want to jump in? And, and you know, does her writing sort of represent, um, does it make a shift in in the war and I you know, I am someone who likes to take a broad view of modernism mm -hmm. and she you know, we're all kind of recognizing that she works very self consciously against the conventions of realism at many levels. And so I guess I would ask another question which is if we do say she's a modernist, where does that get us? At what have we <laughs> at what have we arrived? Right. What does that yield? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I don't know. So I mean I sort of tend to um, I sort of tend to, um, you know, avoid that question. I guess as well in a as I might make other people responsible for it. You know, she um, certainly will always be remembered as somebody who represents for us in very new ways what modern, you know, what it, what it meant to be to be modern, right? What it, yeah. what it meant to be, you know, sort of living in the midst of the, of the Blitz. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think your your really broadening the discussion beyond the kind of you know, narrow view of canonical modernism in ways that I think are very, yeah. very I, I, I saw somebody describe, or I can't remember where this happened, but I, I heard somebody describe The Heat of the Day as a novel that, um, like a Virginia Woolf novel filtered through the point of view of Graham Greene. Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of like the high modernism, the, the sort of like ex mm -hmm. highly experimental language mm -hmm. filtered through the sensibility that's interested in mass culture, that's interested in readability. Yeah. So, believe it or not, Bowen is actually, in, I think, interested in certain levels, certainly in the short fiction, in readability in the way that Joyce is not interested in, right? Mm -hmm. 
right? Um, so, so I think that, um, you know, I tend to think of her as sort of on that cutting edge, right, where she's, she's read a lot of modernism. Um, the influence of modernism is really strong, but she's also thinking about um, mass culture, I think, in a way that maybe arguably Wolf wasn't, although you would right. probably disagree with me, I don't know. Um, no, but, I, would, I would, yeah. But yes, that question is bone modern. I don't know. I tried to make my class answer that question today, and I got yeah. I don't know. We figured it out. Yeah. Going once. Yeah, Sam. Just a quick question. I think. I mean, I love the way that you put together the the, um, the picture of the piano and the Remington as as a lot before the the Hitler's bathtub photograph, but accepting the copy as well. Sort of, at least collaborative agency there. I mean, you, you, you were sort of pointing out that these are surrealists, as I took it, just as much as the, the Hitler's bathtub photograph, some of them are, or defamiliarized in the same way that the later photograph does. But the, the, the Hitler's bathtub photograph is, is performative and, and choreographed yeah. in, a sort of, in ways that explicitly flag it as yeah. arranged right, in a way that these photographs don't. Not necessarily. So, yeah. what merits that sort of staging? I mean, is it that is it using surrealism, and it looks like a Dali picture, some with like sort of items on the same plane, sort yeah. of coming out of you. I mean, is it mocking <coughs> Hitler after beating him? Is it is it taking domestic items because they weren't blown up and blowing them up mm -hmm. in, in lieu of actual physical? Yeah. I mean, what do you think is going on with that? That sort of represented. I'm not sure, and Beth, I mean, you might, you might, you might disagree. I'm not sure that, that um, and I don't, maybe this is not what you're suggesting, that, that you know, a kind of performative or, or kind of stage quality to an image, um, this, like, um, disqualifies it from, from being kind of capital S surrealist um, artwork. Oh, no, yeah. Um, okay, so, so what I think is happening in the, in the, um, in the bathroom photo is, is something like you know, kind of amping up that that idea of surrealism as you know, a, a, um, meeting on a dissection table between an umbrella and a sewing machine. Mm -hmm. Really taking that idea of of taking two things that don't belong and putting them in a situation where neither of them makes sense. Um, almost, it's almost sort of too literal. I think that that's what makes the photograph maybe um, I don't know, maybe even a little shocky uh, that you know that there is this kind of literalizing of this surrealist attitude toward. Um, Weird juxtaposition and, and decontextualization. Um, the, uh, the the photographs. I mean, I'm not sure to what degree these photographs might have been staged. So, for example, like I don't know if Miller might have, you know, positioned them in such a way that maximizes, you know. It seems like the visual rhetoric is realism here. Right? These present themselves as. Yeah. We don't. We aren't shown the stage in the way that we. Have. That's right. Yeah, I think that that's right. Um, and your framing makes it seem like the Hitler's back to photograph is sort of hokey in a sort of politically important way that these aren't, right? That these are sort of realist in a kind of tragic mode. Yeah. Whereas there's a joke going on in the Hitler's back. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I sort of, I'm still interested in sort of recuperating um, the political valence and the political agency of these, of these photographs, even <laughs> though I think on the face of it, they don't, they don't do the kind of work that Carter or, or um, or Murrow kind of hope that they would, right? So they don't offer access. They don't, um, I don't think that they invite really anything like an empathic response of the viewer. Um, but I think that they, uh, I think that they are articulate in certain ways, right? So like I think that there is something, um, like I think that there is always something, I'm, I mean, similarly literal in the way that, you know, what does a smash typewriter mean? Well, it means that this culture is trying to take away our ability to think and write and communicate. Um, so, and sometimes, I mean, that is sort of my, where my impatience for surrealism uh, derives, <laughs> is where uh, it goes so far as to be, uh, like, really transparent about what it's doing. Um, that, well, yeah. on the other hand, with the, the Remington silence, uh, I mean, it's also about the interpenetration of various modes of representation. There's writing, there's yeah. the visual, there's the literal collapse of writing yeah. into the visual. Into the visual, right. In that photograph. Right. And that's a fundamental function of the surrealist attitude yeah. as Krauss outlines it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that actually and, and that actually like it, this is legible. It's legible in the way that writing is legible, but in kind of in a different representational register. Um, I think that what um, 
what Miller, I mean, Miller had this really fraught attitude toward her own writing. She was really good at it, but she hated she, writing. She, she struggled, hated writing. struggled and so there is, a lot. Right, so there is this sort of like celebration that perhaps like this isn't going to be a literary war. Well, she hasn't yet literary written literary really much yet. When right. she did this one with the Blitz, it wasn't until she, the first story she did for Vogue was the story about Murrow. Yeah, right, Murrow. right, 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 right. Right. Uh, which is really interesting, yeah. too. Yeah. I, I don't know if you've gotten into the fact that uh, they, there was included in the, there was a, a you, you mentioned Grim Glory going to the United States. There was this exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 41, uh -huh. that, um, Britain at War, yeah. uh, that included a whole wall of photographs by Miller mm -hmm. in it, um, which are just starting to kind of make their way into the, yeah, I, I gave the, a copy of the catalog to Tony Penrose, and he hadn't seen it before. So, um, you know, so it's just starting to make its way into that. That you know, I mean, yeah, she showed stuff at MoMA. Yeah, yeah. That early, right? And it, I mean, there's other interesting stuff. Some of her correspondence and comments that she makes uh, about this this take on surrealism that's happening more broadly. Mm -hmm. She's kind of critical. Yeah. Of like the mass or the, the, the kind of mass conception of what surrealism is, yeah. uh, with some of her friends or with letters to Roland Penrose back and forth, she's, she says things like, "Oh yeah, this is just too obvious" or something. Yeah, yeah. Or she, you know, and, be, and she would not, she would disown things that we would say are just weird surrealist juxtapositions of things, yeah, yeah. or as like, "Nah, nah, nah, that's not it." And right. then she goes and makes things like. Yeah. Like these images. Yeah, yeah. They, they, I'm thinking, they, they, they function on a different level. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of the, like, Dali is sort of like the person that I tend to like whip the hardest. Um, well, so, he, so did everybody else. In right, the yeah, so he's, he's got a painting that is literally of a umbrella and a sewing machine on a dissection table, like in this kind of like well, the, I mean, recognizably. Yeah, I mean, you have to differentiate between early Dali and the paranoid yeah. kind of stuff, and yeah. then what, when he like became a Vita Dollars yeah, like, yeah. later on. Yeah. And yeah, they sold out and. Yeah. yeah don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, Dan. Um, so I don't mean to stray away from the actual time period that we're discussing here, yeah. but I found the earlier comment about this time that we're living in now sort of being similar to the 1930s. I found that really interesting. And um, maybe it's because I'm so young, I'm only 23, and I haven't lived through enough to really know. But it seems like right now in this country, we're going through a very surreal period of what is going on? I feel like there's a collective yeah. consciousness of, is this real, like, what, you know, whether it's political or just, uh, mostly political. Um, and yeah. I'm wondering how, um, first of all, I'm, I'm interested in what will arise out of that, whether it's a similar artistic um, response such as this, and what will happen on an actual, you know, what this will turn into um, yeah. as it relates to the world. But I'm wondering about one of the quotes that you had, um, I think it was Rosalind Krauss that said it. Uh -huh. uh, drawings and paintings are icons, while photographs are uh, Indi indexes. indexes. Indexes, yeah, I missed the last word. But I'm wondering if you think that that quote still holds true today, because um, I hope I don't offend anyone here, because I know that photography and film is you know, a, why a lot of people are here. I'm wondering if photography has become sort of the new icon, whereas maybe film, um, the actual moving picture, is the new index, if that makes any sense. Well, you know, I think like Tom Gunning has, uh, I'll send you the article, um, Tom Gunning has has this sort of take on, um, you know, what what are the implications of all of this conversation about photography that that um, that assumes material, right? That, that assumes film, that assumes that, that this thing about photographs being like a fingerprint um, is real in this kind of material way. Um, how do we sort of use that visual, that, that language, that conceptual language of, to talk about photography in the context of uh, an age where we're taking digital photographs, right? Where we don't have, where a photograph is not a, a fingerprint, a photograph is not a fossil, a photograph is binary code, right? It's, it's a series of ones and zeros. But he has this attitude that I think is, is registers to me that there's something effective that is similarly um, similarly legitimate, right? So we have these effective emotional um, attachments and re um, reactions to photography in a way that I think, you know, the ways that Roland Barthes describes photography, um, it still resides, it still, it still registers, or it still resonates. Um, you look like you want to jump in and I will allow you to do that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I, something dawned on me. <laughs> 
uh, linguistics, in linguistics, you have an affectional um, uh, <coughs> idea about language, and that is, it's, it's very affective. Yeah. And so when you use that word, I just thought of tying it in with linguistics and the typewriter, the killing off of language. Yeah. As you say, the killing off of communication. Yeah. Um, all of that stuff. So that was a very good time. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I, like, so, so we live in this really interesting kind of taught moment, cultural moment, when it comes to photography, because we, um, you know, we understand that images are sort of infinitely manipulable, right? So, you know, I don't take for granted that the image that I see has really any bearing on the reality that it um, does or does not represent. Um, and yet, you know, there is, I think, we, st I think we still don't have a the full sort of means of extricating ourselves from the kinds of habits of mind that we formed as a culture, thinking about um, thinking about analog photography, right? Thinking about the photograph as an imprint on the real, and and that I think is why you know Krauss in, in this article, um, the, the photographic conditions of the surrealism, and, and Andre Bazin in the ontology of the photographic image says, well, surrealists you know really took to this stuff because. Photographs more than any other art form collapse the divide between reality and representation. I think that's really interesting. I also think that there's a kind of limitation to that view that, um, that in certain ways I think Miller might be, might be thinking about. Um, so I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I think that um, you know we are living in very surrealist times, very surreal times, and what one hopes is that the epistemological and the political questions that surrealism is asking are, are gonna be asked along with our sort of cultural sense that this is weird. Um, because the surrealists, you know, um, this is maybe the, the way that we've, we've forgotten what the project of surrealism is about, that they're asking political questions, they're preparing for a revolution. Um, they're not, uh, it's not just about putting weird things on trays and taking their photographs. I think that there's a kind of, um, a kind of mental revolution and a political revolution that they're setting the stage for. And, uh, and you know, at the same time as we've got, um, this machine monster reincarnate. Um, we've also got a burgeoning, I think, left-wing radical um, mm -hmm. conversation radical happening, radical. and uh, and you know. Anyway, I'll leave mm -hmm. that. Well, we need two wings to fly. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's what I yeah. 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 Anyway, thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'm tired. <laughs> Great.